Good evening, everybody. Tonight, both President-elect Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin are calling for a boost in their country's nuclear capabilities. Has Putin finally met his match? Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters joins me tonight on the future of U.S.-Russia relations. Also, the president-elect working hard to make America safe again. I will suspend immigration and refugee admissions from regions where they cannot be safely processed or vetted. That, as President Obama is dismantling a registry that tracks immigrants from jihadist countries, the newly named senior counselor to President-elect Donald Trump. Kellyanne Conway joins us tonight, and political correctness on campus run amok. Students at the University of Virginia, in particular, waging a war on Christmas. Pastors Robert Jeffress and Daryl Scott join me tonight. Good evening, everybody. Our top story, President-elect Donald Trump today filling key positions in his administration. Trump tapping Sean Spicer as assistant to the president and press secretary. Spicer has been Republican National Committee Communications Director since 2011 and the party's chief strategist since 2015. Hope Hicks, named assistant to the president, director of strategic communications, Jason Miller to become director of communications, and Dan Scavino, director of social media. Joining me now, the newly named counselor to President-elect Trump, Kellyanne Conway. First of all, Kellyanne, congratulations. Uh, this is a, a wonderful thing for you. I know it also requires considerable sacrifice on your part and your family. Uh, but it's also wonderful the, for the country. So in addition to congratulations uh, uh, from me, at least uh, certainly a, a thank you as well for what you're what you're doing for the country. Lou, thank you so much. Means a great deal to me coming from you. Thank you. And, and we'll and we'll turn first to uh, the the Trump administration is underway uh, with 28 days to go yet before uh, President elect Trump is sworn in. I have never seen a faster start to any administration or a faster receding from public view uh, than President Obama's. This is really remarkable. He's delivering already on the tone and the pace that he promised as a candidate. He's also delivering on the content, Lou. He's putting together this cabinet in, in a way that reflects what his agenda for those first 100 days and beyond is. He's putting together free market thinkers who are going to help him create those 25 million jobs over 10 years and unleash energy and do the infrastructure program, repeal and replace Obamacare, do the immigration reform that he's promised. And, and also, I think it's, it's he set the... He set the pace and the tone, the content, but he's done something else. You know, he's really threaded the needle, President-elect Trump has, between being the next president and being respectful that we still have a president. So he stopped mm -hmm. short of making new policy oh, with absolutely. respect to foreign policy or domestic policy. But at the same time, he's not waiting until January 20th to get all the levers in motion. That respect uh, and, and consideration does not appear at this point to be reciprocal, however. Uh, President Obama still pressing forward, uh, taking uh, Muslims, uh, largely Muslims, off a, a registry, an immigration registry, uh, making a, a decided point there. Uh, he is still, if you will, putting his, uh, making himself felt uh, in the most irritating of ways, or at least attempting to. I don't get the sense whatsoever that the, uh, the president-elect is bothered by it at all, though. Uh, not particularly. I think from a, a form and uh, non-substantive perspective, the president and his uh, closest advisors have been very helpful to the president-elect and his close advisors in terms of promising this transition from administration to administration. Uh, but that aside, these men differ ideologically and they differ substantively. And in some ways, the election, in many ways, the election of President Donald J. Trump was a rebuke and a rejection of many of the policies that sure. they, we've had over the last four to eight years. That's very clear. You look at the polls, Lou, and you quickly see that some Americans see as as health care, Obamacare, as President Obama's greatest accomplishment. 
but a, a nearly equal number see it as his greatest failure. And so you, f you see a very divided country on the issues as well. Um, but we're not that worried about the executive orders and the flurry of activity that are happening. Some people try to do that to make up for the unfinished business in the closing days and weeks of their administrations. But we know what the, we'll read the public's mood on, on many different issues, and we'll match that up with what the president-elect has promised to do on these issues. And, and you'll see real change in progress. I think it's it's draining the swamp, but it's also it's also making sure that we have prosperity and safety again. People feel less prosperous and certainly less safe than they did a few short years ago. And very quickly, uh, the president bringing in the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and Boeing, reaching agreement uh, uh, based on the on the remarks of not the uh, the uh, prospective White House or the uh, the transition or the president elect, but from the CEOs themselves. They're going to bring that $4 billion plus uh, Air Force One contract for two uh, in under uh, $4 billion. They talked about affordability. They talked about how nice it is to be talking uh, with someone who actually knows what he's talking about when it comes to business and issues. Uh, so there's a whole tone here uh, that to me is important. Uh, the substance is critical, of course, but you're talking about people who were not necessarily aligned with Donald Trump, who's going after the establishment, uh, talking favorably and enlisting, if you will, in the movement. And this one's pretty simple, Lou. This is Donald Trump as the president-elect making good on his promise to always protect the taxpayer and to protect the public fisc. So let's, let's retrace the steps very briefly. Two weeks ago, the president-elect issued a tweet that uh, he thought the, the aircraft was uh, too expensive. He wants everybody to be compensated fairly, but he also doesn't want us to be holding the bag in the bill. I mean, how refreshing is that? Right. Isn't that the first job after keeping the nation secure, making sure our money's not wasted? And so he's making good on that. Uh, fast forward, what's happened over time is he, he met with these CEOs, and uh, lo and behold, we discover that the project is years behind and millions over budget, and that they'll find a way to reduce the cost without reducing the quality. That's exactly what he's promising to do. That's exactly why somebody who goes to Washington as a successful, brilliant businessman owing no one anything, is in the exact position to get this done on behalf of the taxpayer. And uh, I, I, over the last 24 hours, a peculiar sort of communication uh, uh, conflict, if you will. Newt Gingrich saying that uh, no longer did, was Donald Trump interested in draining the swamp. Uh, Corey Lewandowski coming up with something very similar. Uh, the president-elect saying... No, we're draining the swamp and we'll persist in doing so. Uh, reconcile it for us. I think the president-elect uh, is it trumps the other statements. And, you know, Corey Lewandowski, a trusted advisor, the first campaign manager of a year, took Donald Trump through the primaries very successfully. And uh, a friend of mine, Newt Gingrich, a friend of mine and a mentor of mine, Newt said today on Twitter, I goofed. Donald Trump will, in fact, drain the swamp, and the alligator should be uh, should be aware. Uh, I think we'll just go back to what the president-elect has said many times. Draining the swamp, Lou, means sort of the lobbyists, the culture of corruption, the, and I would say the consultants, what I affectionately refer to as the staff infection. No more no-show <laughs> jobs and contracts for people, Lou, who have not had a creative idea in 22 years. Uh, there's no reason to pay them for nothing. And so, and I, I think that that all goes together. It doesn't mean you won't have qualified and well compensated men and women in different areas, publicly and privately, uh, doing their best to help uh, lead the for lead the country forward. But at the same time, just as Donald Trump did with the Boeing project, the Lockheed Martin project that you talked about, uh, we just don't want to pay too much for stuff as a government, and and uh, you know perhaps even with the Republican Party. And that's and a that's whole new the perspective way, to I think, bring. To go for it. That's right. That's a whole new that's perspective. Right. But he can do it. Uh, he can do it. And and while we're you know while we're draining the swamp, people are trying to throw more crocodiles in it. To beware because we'll be, you know, we'll be grabbing the air and tossing them back. Thanks for being with us. Kellyanne Conway. Merry Christmas to you and yours, Lou. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Coming up next, President elect Trump and Vladimir Putin today reveal what they each want when it comes to the future of nuclear weapons. And do they agree? Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters joins me next. We're coming right back. Stay with us. Breaking news now, President-elect Trump revealing on social media his thoughts about our nuclear capability. Trump tweeted this, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability. 
until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. His tweet came just hours after Vladimir Putin called for boosting his country's nuclear abilities. But it's far from a, a nuclear arms race. Nonetheless, the president-elect gave additional insight, saying through his transition team, quote, President-elect Trump was referring to the threat of nuclear proliferation and the critical need to prevent it, particularly to and among terrorist organizations and unstable and rogue regimes. He's also emphasized the need to improve and modernize our deterrent capability is a vital way to pursue peace through strength. Joining us tonight, Fox News strategic analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Ralph, great to have you with us. And Hello. And Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and Happy Holidays to all. It's a, it's a wonderful time. I, I, and even as we're sitting here talking about uh, uh, nuclear capabilities, in your judgment, is Donald Trump right or wrong on this issue? On this one, I'll, I'll give you a little. He is 100% right. Our nuclear triad, that is a combination of land-based missiles, mm -hmm. submarine-launched missiles, and air-delivered, air aircraft-delivered uh, weapons, it's been desperately in need of modernization. We've been just kind of putting patches on the elbows and knees for a long time. Now we need true modernization. But not just that. Beyond the hardware itself, um, which is overdue uh, for replacement, we also need to get back to a clear-cut doctrine that Obama's really muddied very much. The, the paradox of nuclear weapons, Lou, is you want them so terrible and frightening that you never have to use them. But with that, you also need the doctrine that says, hey, we are not going to let you hit us first. Uh, you know, we, you threaten us with nuclear weapons or try to use them against mm -hmm. us, and you will pay a disproportionate price, not a little tit for tat. Yeah, in the case of North Korea, however, that's been violated because they've threatened on a number of occasions a nuclear, uh, a nuclear yeah. wasteland as a result of their program. Uh, yeah. But that is, I understand, uh, is uh, independent to uh, independent from uh, either Russia or uh, China, a, a special problem, if you will, in geopolitics. Let me turn to the way in which he is uh, uh, reacting, talking about uh, being right on the issue of Muslim uh, immigration uh, from jihadist countries. In fact, immigration from jihadist countries. Uh, and what we have seen happening in Berlin, in Germany, uh, over the course of this week, the terrorist attack, the terrible terrorist attack, this is looming as a, as a absolute uh, a, in, in, incipient point at which U.S. policy has to change. So does Europe. What do you think? Well, I think there are several things in play. Uh, the issues behind the issues. One is that the Obama wing of the Democratic Party uh, views immigration as a tool of social engineering. It's an article of faith with them that the less our country resembles the Founding Fathers, the better our country will be. And on top of that, you have the left's infatuation with Islam. Now, Muslims can come in a lot of different flavors. Most American Muslims are overwhelmingly constructive, law-abiding citizens. But the unwillingness to accept that radical Islam extreme fanatical Islam is a disease within that community that has to be torn out, cut out like a cancer. Well, it just baffles me with the left. Uh, I'm willing to face it. I mean, Chancellor Merkel is willing to face it. She's learned her lesson, but Obama is going to go out doing everything he can. What's the evidence of that? She's brought in uh, somewhere around a million uh, refugees, many of them illegally, uh, and opened uh, wide uh, the arms of Germany to these people without proper vetting. With, and well, she has not recanted. She's played yes, a few she electoral... Well, no. let me finish. She's played a couple of electoral games, but meanwhile, uh, her policies re remain in place. Well, no, they don't. Actually, Lou, uh, Germany has tightened back up considerably. She knows, Ch Chancellor Merkel, our best friend in Europe, by the way, and perhaps mm -hmm. the last man in Europe, knows she screwed up big time. That was the Lutheran pastor's daughter from old East Germany coming out at her. Mm -hmm. And since then, they've tried to tighten up. But as we saw with Berlin and the difficulty in arresting um, Anas Omri when they knew he was a threat, Germany is saddled with two things. One, it is a legacy of the Nazi era. So there are yeah, new but, constitutions. I mean, this, this is all well and good, but I'm talking about current policy. Rather than a, the historical context, the cultural History context, is with us. Amazing guilt, the guilt that, uh, you know, that we can uh, analyze uh, forever. And it will 
it will only be rationalization in, in, in the minds of many. The fact of the matter is, Angela Merkel and her party remain favored. They remain in popular opinion with open borders to be supported. It has dropped significantly, but in effect, those liberal left policies of Angela Merkel that are leading directly, it appears, uh, to, the, to the, these terrorist acts, you know, it is not changing. They have well, not... And, Lou, and until there is a recognition of what they've done and what they must do, uh, it seems like a, a, a peculiar journey to take, either intellectually or in terms of the policies that re it, remain committed to open borders. I, it, it requires constitutional changes in the German law to let the police do their job, let the intelligence agencies do their job. And let's not forget, Angela Merkel is not a leftist. Her party is the Christian Democratic Party, allied with the Christian Social Union. They're right of center. She, again, they screwed up the immigration policy because of their history. Germany wants to be seen as a good guy nation, generous to all. And now they're trying to fix it. And as we know from our own experience, fixing it is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when I hear American conservatives she, uh, making common cause with these far-right parties in Europe, they're Putin-funded American-hating par America right. parties. It's about more than just immigration. It's about a lot more than immigration. Yeah. And uh, the neoliberal globalists, and, uh, of which uh, uh, Angela Merkel uh, is an important, uh, if you will, flagpole, uh, and, you know, it's it just, uh, it's amazing when we sit here talking about right and left on a spectrum that is global, in which she fits only one part, and that is certainly uh, neoliberal or, or, or left, uh, at least in my view. Colonel, uh, we're going to have to Not in my view. Lou, I traded yeah, a Colonel, thousand we're of Barack have, Obamas you know for what? one Angela Merkel. Well, you know what? The great news is, you do that, I don't have to, and neither does the country. Thanks so much. But it's quite a trade-off you're creating there. Thanks so much. Yeah. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight. The question is, do you agree with President-elect Trump that we need to temporarily suspend Muslim immigration from jihadist countries? We'd like to hear from you. Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street, stocks pulling back as we head into the holidays. The Dow Jones Industrials dropping 23 points. The S&P down four. The Nasdaq down 24. Volume on the big board picking up to 3.9 billion shares. A reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast, on the Salem Radio Network. Up next, shocking new documents show Hillary Clinton's top aides communicating with the so-called faithless electors and those who were trying to flip the Electoral College to stop Donald Trump. Emails, calls, text messages, all in effort to subvert the will of the American voter. We'll have the, and the Constitution, we might add, we'll have the story for you and much more straight ahead. Stay with us. Ivanka Trump and her three children harassed by a fellow passenger today on a JetBlue flight out of New York. The man described as an out-of-control passenger, verbally berating the president-elect's daughter, jeering at her children, according to witnesses. Those witnesses say the passenger, who was holding his own child in his arms, yelled, quote, your father is ruining the country. Why is she on our flight? JetBlue personnel escorted the disruptive passenger off the flight, issued this statement, quote, the decision to remove a customer from a flight is not taken lightly. If the crew determines that a customer is causing conflict on the aircraft, the customer will be asked to deplane especially if the crew feels the situation runs the risk of escalation during flight. Well, we're now learning about the desperate measures employed by the Clinton campaign trying to interfere with the outcome of the election and the outcome of the Electoral College vote as well. Politico reporting that Clinton's top aides kept in constant contact with Electoral College defectors and those seeking to disrupt the electoral vote. Emails from Jennifer Paul Mary and Jake Sullivan show they kept in touch with organizers of that effort for weeks. One of the first conversations occurred with Colorado elector Michael Baca. Baca was one of the leaders of a group trying to flip Republican electors to a third party candidate. Baca now faces investigation by the state attorney general for possible charges for switching his vote to Governor John Kasich of Ohio. The futile efforts of the so-called Faithless electors, of course, died Monday. 
Ironically uh, enough, uh, Hillary Clinton lost more electors than Trump. Trump, uh, by the way, only had two electors uh, defect. Uh, so quite an effort uh, there uh, led by the, uh, well, the losing Dems. Uh, the metro in the nation's capital is under fire tonight, breaking with tradition, not including any mention of our next president on the Inauguration Day Smart Trip card. The metro claims they omitted a Trump photo because the president-elect's team never authorized a picture for use before the cards were printed. But permission is required to at least include Trump's name, which they didn't do. President Obama, however... There he is. He was featured prominently on the inauguration cards in 2009 and 2013. That swap definitely needs some draining. Up next, the president-elect, well, he's sticking to his battle cry that helped him win the White House. We are going to Washington, D.C., and we are going to drain the swamp. You probably heard me say it. Drain the swamp. Here we go. President Obama is blaming Fox News for his failures as president. In an interview with The Atlantic magazine, the president said, quote, If people are angry that somehow the government is failing, then they are going to look to the guy who represents government. And that applies, by the way, even to some of the folks who are now Trump supporters, they're responding to a fictional character named Barack Obama, who they see on Fox News or who they hear about through Rush Limbaugh. Joining me now to make sense of all of this, veteran of Tenton presidential campaigns, Republican strategist Ed Rollins. Ed, great to see you. What is he doing? What's he on in Hawaii? Well, Hawaii is a wonderful place, and it's a very relaxing place. But certainly, th these aren't clear, coherent thoughts. For a man that's been president for eight years to, to basically uh, blame Fox News or Rush or anybody else for his demise, uh, he, ha he had bad policy most of the time. He, he basically got outside the box and tried to ex make more presidential politics than he, than he had. And he basically let his party get destroyed. Uh, you know, there's, there's far fewer governors, far fewer state legislatures, uh, far He's members of Congress. He's destroyed the Democratic Party really, single-handedly. Really, really now, is. if he wants to give credit to Fox News, I, I for one, think that that is a, a, a perfectly wonderful uh, Christmas gift. But if he's trying to say that it wasn't his policies, his demeanor, his conduct, his just ultra-left approach and anti-democratic approach... To, to the presidency, uh, then he's deluding himself. Well, I think he is, and I think to a certain extent uh, he'll have lots of time to reflect back on it and go write his, 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 his book uh, and basically uh, do whatever he's That's gonna going do. to be a very thin book if it's about actual accomplishment, <laughs> achievement. Uh, uh, well, he better, in the he, White better House. he better write it awful quick because I think Mr. Trump's going to undo a lot of the stuff that he did by executive order in about the first uh, uh, two weeks, so uh, for the good of the country. So I, I think to a certain extent. Uh, you know, it's always hard at the end of a presidency. It's always hard to move on. Uh, they say presidents have two good days, the day they get inaugurated, the day they dedicate their library. Yeah. We, we can't wait for them to dedicate his library. Yeah, I, uh, that's, uh, to me, th this is a great day for America that is approaching, and that is uh, with Barack Obama leaving the White House and President uh, Donald J. Trump walking in. Uh, that is a, a, an inflection point in American history, and, and what I personally believe is critical to the survival of the republic. I, I, not just the republic. I think the free world needs a very significant leader from America, which we haven't had for a period of time. And as we watch all these various problems and we watch dictators rise up elsewhere, we need to project yeah. strength again, and certainly he will do that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm more modest in my, my concerns and aspirations. I just want to save the republic. Well, that's good. I, we need to save the republic. There's a lot of people who don't like the republic anymore and yeah. want, to, want to alter that part of it. But I, This little um, blip today... Uh, Newt Gingrich and, and Corey Lewandowski putting out the word that the president-elect no longer wanted to use the expression "drain the swamp." What do you make of that? And how could they have gotten? How could they representing? They were speaking for the president-elect. Well, fortunately, neither. Both are friends of mine. They don't get to speak for the president-elect. The president-elect tapped into a real slogan that drain the swamp, which is very symbolic to a lot of Americans, of going in there, fixing the system that's broken, yeah. 
and I think he's going to do that. Uh, so what they say is not relevant. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, we'll, we'll see what the president does, and I think he's going to have a very fast start, and he's got some very capable people around him, and I think he's going to have a tremendous, tremendous kickoff here. Yeah, this is a tremendous kickoff. It's fabulous. It fabulous. is. And Kellyanne Conway... Uh, you know, she's a good girl. Extraordinary. Uh, great, lo great lady. I shouldn't say girl. I guess she's, she's a girl, but she's a great, great young lady who's going to be a very significant player for, for the country. Counselor to the president. That's a very honored title. Uh, some great people have had that title in the past, and I hope she does half as well as Ed Meese did, who had it, or Karen Hughes, who had it uh, for George W. Bush. Well, I think she'll do. She'll do just I fine. I think she'll do double what they did. And she'll be real. I just build those. Expectations. Nah, she'll be a real inspiration too, uh, as as as, 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 a, as a working mother with four kids who so make sure her kids are not going to be neglected. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I congratulate her on the job. I just think she's going to be such a, a, a force, uh, an intellect, uh, uh, and, and just a terrific person to have uh, next uh, uh, to the president when uh, when he needs uh, sage counsel and uh, a, a well, great a person. It's a great person. There's others there, too, that, uh, but, but she, cert she certainly played a very critical role. We'll yep, to play absolutely. It, uh, it, it was quite something. And Ed Rollins is quite something. Thank it's you, my friend. Good to Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. It's nice to be able to say that again, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? I've always said it, but it's just Merry I, Christmas. Yeah, me too. Those, but, those of you who don't recognize Christmas, wish you happy holidays, but Merry Christmas to those of us that care about it. I can say amen, brother. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed Rollins. <laughs> President Obama today announcing he's formally scrapping the once mandatory registry for immigrant men from visiting from jihadist countries. The program launched after the September 11th terrorist attacks hasn't been in use since 2011. And the United Nations today indefinitely postponed a vote that sought to condemn Israeli settlement construction in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The delay came hours after the president-elect publicly urged that resolution be vetoed. Joining me now, former senior advisor to UK Prime Minister David Cameron, Steve Hilton joins us. Steve, thanks for being here. And let's start with first the United Nations mm -hmm. vote. Uh, uh, well, the deferral of that yeah. vote. It, it seemed to be specifically uh, tied to uh, one cause, and that is Donald J. Trump, president-elect, saying this should be vetoed. And it's just so interesting, the energy he's bringing to the role even before he's there, and you're seeing it all over the place. And I thought this was really encouraging. It shows that actually the world is understanding now that there are going to be some big changes. It is not going to be business as usual. And that is what I think we need to see on so many areas of policy. And today was a really strong, specific example. And, and we watched something that I just don't think there's been a parallel. Uh, the opposition of business to the anti-establishment candidate, that is Donald Trump, uh, is understandable, was understandable, and next CEOs are showing up uh, in Florida uh, at Mar-a-Lago and uh, meeting with the president, specifically Lockheed Martin and Boeing, to talk about uh, reducing below the uh, $4 billion threshold uh, the, the construction of two Air Force One uh, aircraft and, and the F-35 program, which is totally out of control and yeah. represents billions and billions of dollars. These big corporations, I saw it myself when I was inside government in the UK with David Cameron, these big corporations have been ripping off the taxpayer for decades, probably even more than decades. And that's because there's never been anyone in charge who really understands how to properly negotiate, who takes the personal interest in these massive deals that cost the taxpayer so much money. And it's not just that the money is way over what should be paid. The quality of what's delivered is often poor. And that all goes to the heart of Trump's argument during the campaign about draining the swamp. Because the reason that these terrible contracts go through is because the people doing the procurement deals, the civil servants and the bureaucrats, know that when they leave, they're going to end up advising those companies or on the boards of those companies. That whole mess is something that he's really going to have to clear up, and he's starting right now. Yeah, and, and he is serving a, an important uh, uh, notice on them. Uh, there, th these are public-private partnerships between our, some of our leading uh, corporations in the defense industry and, of course, the federal government. Not recognized as such often by the left-wing media, but that's precisely what they are. And there is a relationship, uh, or sometimes not from the conservative side either. But there is an important relationship that has to be balanced, and Donald Trump is taking that on. I want to ask you, because talking about uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, you, uh, as we were announcing the news of these appointments by uh, President-elect Trump today, 
uh, Kellyanne Conway uh, moving into the uh, West Wing. Uh, it appears she's going to be right next to yeah. the president. Uh, it looks like there's a, a, a real emphasis now on the people who got him there. Yeah. And that's that makes me personally feel better. And yeah. also to see someone with uh, Kellyanne's immense capability and achievement uh, stepping in to, to be of service. It's really good news. When I heard that announcement today, the fact that she was going to be inside, really close to him, and not, by the way, just playing a communications role or as press secretary, a really serious substantive role right at his side. I think that's incredibly important because you've got her, you've got Steve Bannon, you've got people that really understand what the mission is, the mission to really shake things up. Because pressure's going to come from the establishment to do business as usual, and you've got to have those allies with you right at your side to keep going and to deliver the promises that he was elected on. And, and, the, and the brief uh, suggestion that the president-elect uh, was going to abandon drain the swamp was uh, immediately... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that illusion was uh, put, to, put to rest, and, and, and the president-elect made it clear. He's still swamp, uh, swamp draining. <laughs> Steve Helton, great to have you with us. Great to see you. Thanks so much. We're behind on giving answers to our poll results. I apologize. Uh, we asked Monday, do you think it's possible the Democratic Party will ever, ever recover from Barack Obama? 57% of you said yes, it is, uh, it is likely he will never recover. Tuesday, we ask you, do you believe the Justice Department should be investigating all threats and harassment of Electoral College members? 94% of you said yes, it should. I agree with you in all cases. And last night we asked you, will President Obama go down as the worst president in history? I, I have to tell you, I'm in favor of this shorter question. Uh, we may go to that as a matter of policy from here on. 88% of you said yes. The reason, by the way, we had to do some makeup is uh, yours truly got a little long-winded. It was an aberration from my career. I assure you it'll never, ever happen again. Up next, the war on Christmas hitting college campuses. We are uh, just kind of letting the administration know that a lot of students on campus choose not to celebrate anything okay. in the winter season. Cool. It's like a very Christian normative mm -hmm. campus and so we feel like it's just not really a safe space for people of different faith traditions. Pastors Daryl Scott and Robert Jeffries join me next to take all of that up. Stay with us. We'll be right back. A war on Christmas. At the University of Virginia. The University of Virginia has been bringing us a lot of nonsense this year, and I, for one, hope it's uh, concluding. The conservative website uh, Campus Reform sent reporters to talk with dozens of UVA students who agreed to sign a fake petition that would ban any reference to Christmas at their school. This time of year, it feels like people can like shove their like holiday like happiness in your face, like yeah, Merry Christmas, like ooh, and it's just you know it gets kind of old. So we're just sending a letter to the administration to be like, hey, like this can be like almost oppressive for some people. Um, mm -hmm. Would you guys like to sign? I will totally sign. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, joining me now, member of the Faith Advisory Council for Donald Trump, pastor at First Baptist Church in Dallas, Pastor Robert Jeffers. Pastor, great to have you with us. Senior Pastor of the New Spirit Revival Center, Pastor Daryl Scott. Pastor, great to have you with us. And what do you make? I thought, to be honest, I, I, you know, I was just talking with a number of guests about it's okay to say Merry Christmas now. Thank you, Donald Trump. Apparently at UVA, that's going to be kind of a sketchy, uh, sketchy possibility. Uh, Pastor Jeffers, your, your reaction. <laughs> well, look, you know, these pinhead students don't even realize that they're acknowledging Christmas every time they write the date 2016 or 2017 on an exam. I mean, we divide history by the coming of Christ into this world. But, Lou, what I want people to understand is this war on Christmas is a part of a larger war on Christianity that was launched by the left, has been facilitated by a liberal judiciary. I mean, think about this. Why was it for the first hundred 160 years of our nation's history, Bible reading, prayer in the schools, nativity scenes were allowed and encouraged, but suddenly they become unconstitutional. Did the Constitution change? Of course not. What has happened is we've allowed liberal judges to pervert the Constitution into something that it should never be. Christians are sick and tired of this, which is why they voted for Donald J. Trump by the largest margin in history. Pastor Scott, I don't think you're going to argue with the, the latter part, certainly. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I agree with Pastor Jeffers wholeheartedly. This assault, this attack on uh, Christmas is actually an assault and attack on Christianity. It's an attack on the person and works of Jesus Christ. It's an attack Amen. on the fact that we believe Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And they have a problem with that. You don't see any other religions under attack. And you don't even see Frosty the Snowman, Santa Claus, or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer <laughs> under attack because they know that those are myths, those are fables, those are uh, 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 fictional tales. But since we believe Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, there's a godless uh, element of society that seeks to impress their godliness upon all of American society and so they want to do away with anything that has uh -huh. reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's public school uh, canceling a Christmas carol uh, you know, because of the you know uh, God bless us everyone one of the most uh, you know iconic lines uh, in in, uh, in, in uh, faith uh, and in uh, uh, plays uh, in, in this country. How can we, why are we putting up with people who would say you've got to get rid of that play because it says God bless everyone? I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to us, yet it's happening. It's happening. You know, Lou, yeah, it's it ridiculous. Me, I'm going Lou, it makes me wonder if that's, these same, the if the, it makes me wonder, yeah, it makes me wonder if these same people want to climb on top of the Washington Monument and scratch out the words that are on the capstone praise be to God. I mean, this nation was founded as a Christian nation. And while we welcome people of all faith and no faith, this nation has always been a Christian nation. Our Supreme Court over and over again, John Jay, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court said, America is a Christian nation. And Pastor Scott, and you know what we acknowledge, we acknowledge God in our constitution. We acknowledge the fact that all men are created Amen. By God and endowed by God with certain inalienable rights. And so, once again, this is an attack on Christianity. I don't see any other religious holidays under attack as the Christian uh, holidays are. We're so uh, busy right. in America trying to promote tolerance, but mm -hmm. this tolerance is, into is tolerating everything except Christianity. You look at Christians as narrow minded bigots, but it, the opposite is actually true. Christianity is being bigoted against. We're under attack. And it's once again the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that is under attack. Amen. But the Bible says no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. <laughs> so we're going to be all right. <laughs> well, with that, right. a, a declaration of victory. It, 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 you know, and, yeah. and, and frankly, there is a new sense in the country, uh, one that is more tolerant, if I can use that expression, of Christianity. Because people have become yeah. extraordinarily intolerant uh, toward the people uh, of faith in this country. And... Uh, Hopefully all of that is changing, and with uh, no small thanks going to a fellow by the name of, uh, uh, well, and title, uh, President-elect <laughs> Donald J. Trump. And you gentlemen play that big right. role Absolutely in that. Absolutely right. Pastor, Amen. Uh, Pastor said, Scott, Pastor he... Jeffers, thank you both so much. Good to see you. Thanks, God Lee. bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's it for us tonight. Thanks for being with us. And Merry Christmas to you from New York. See you later in the new year.